And it is my pleasure to introduce to you our presenter today, Chris Olson. A little bit about Chris. Uh, he's been an independent IT uh, telephony trainer, consultant, author, technical editor for more than 27 years. He's taught more than 80 different courses in Cisco, Microsoft, VMware, uh, Novell. He's done a wide array of IT consulting for many different companies. He's got a Bachelor of Science and in Mechanical Engineering and Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering at Bradley University. Now, Chris is a CCSI. That's a Certified Cisco Systems Instructor. And he has a number of voice and data center specialization. I do want to mention uh, specifically for Chris, he has been most recently awarded by Cisco uh, 2021 Distinguished Instructor Award. Chris, it's all yours. Let's begin. All right, thank you so much and uh, appreciate the introduction. Uh, for everyone, also as we go through here, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and some of which I'll answer during the presentation. And as Brad correctly noted at the end, there are also some time where we can address them as well. Uh, this is the fourth in a current set of series of uh, webinars that I put on. If you've seen the other ones, a common theme which starts on all of this is a very important question, where is the best place to put security in the network? Now, this seminar is not focused on security, but as you'll see, doing monitoring in ACI, it's all about where we have security. So a fair question to ask in this simple example of a network topology, where would be a good place to put security? In yesteryear, connecting the internet, typically the only place would have been, if I go back to the 1990s, a firewall that has access to the internet at some place on where we connect in. This might be an example of a place probably more likely connected to the core, but bottom line, it used to be a few answer. Now, the better answer is everywhere. While switches and routing are needed for connectivity, they also can be security devices. Well, in Cisco ACI, that's always the case. So our subject matter topic here today is all about application-centric infrastructure, Cisco's products, of routing and switching inside a data center. And to be clear, ACI is all about software-defined networking, which means that all the settings for network connectivity and configuration, they're always done inside the server called an APIC. So ACI demands we do this. ACI always demands we have a spine and leaf topology. So ACI needs three different hardware elements, the APIC, spine, and leaf. Now there can be more of them. I show here two spines. There can be typically up to four, five, or six. I show four leafs. We could have even a couple hundred, depending on the version. I show here three APICs. The APIC is a server for management. Technically, you could do ACI with one APIC, not a good design, no fault tolerance. Key point, in software-defined networking, all configuration is done in what's called the northbound connection. The idea of a compass is often used. So if I sit here at Windows or Linux and I want to do some configuration, we do it in the north to the APIC. That's true with everything in security. It's true with everything in the session because all configurations in ACI are never done on the leaf, never done on the spine. Can I putty into the spine and look at it? Sure, but you cannot configure the spine while on the spine. Can you putty into the leaf and configure it? I'm sorry, can you putty in the leaf and look at it? Yes, show commands debugs, of course, there's no configuration done on it. So the APIC configures everything all the way coming through. Next is, where do we plug in all of our end node devices? Like for example, if I have a Windows server, a Linux server, if I have VMware, if I have Microsoft hypervisor, a load balancer, a firewall, on and on we go. Bottom line, everything is plugged into the leaf, not the spine. All end node devices plug in the leaf. So what if we want to do some troubleshooting and we want to look at well, what about traffic from a Linux device here to another Linux service here? In the data center, this is known as east-west traffic. East-west means we're from the network, in the network we haven't left. 
To do so in ACI, we never connect spine to spine. We never connect leaf to leaf. Never done, never supported, not allowed. So if I have traffic from, again, this Linux server to another one, the only way that's going to go is from leaf to spine to another leaf. And ACI always supports equal cost multipathing. So I show two spines here. So which way will it go from Linux 1 to Linux 2? Always both ways. Equal cost multipathing is always there in ACI. It doesn't need to be configured, nothing to turn on, simply always there. Bandwidth always shared, load balancing always present. Is this a router or is that a switch? Are not any more valid questions in ACI. We do not configure routing on an interface. So the idea of switch port or no switch port, that's not done. Is it a router or is it a switch? That's done in software. ACI is always software defined networking. So the switch element is called a bridge domain. The routing element is a VRF. They're done in software. Where's switching, where's routing? Anywhere you want it to be. Networking is done in software. It's logical, it can be anywhere. So do we want routing between two servers or switching? You configure it in software, we don't configure it on interface. Again, the command switch port, no switch port does not apply here in ACI. So back to my example, here I have Linux. Here's another Linux server, they're talking to each other. How can we monitor for point of network troubleshooting? operations. We've all heard the statement, the network is the problem, the network is down. If you deal enough in network engineering, that accusation flies often in many organizations. Question, is it really the network or is it something else? Proof, how do you see exactly where it is? Issue, if we can identify exactly where the traffic flows and see it, it's a good way of seeing where it is or is not the problem. So what if I wanted to see traffic going through here, or here, or here, which is realistic if we have traffic that's east-west? Well, ACI first debuted 1.0 in April 2013. That's when Cisco first came out with it. At that time, the ability to do span was a lot more limited. Some of the first very large customers I work with back around the 2014 timeframe, actually invested in putting physical wiretaps in all the connections. Yes, they had a very big financial budget for that because that's a lot of hardware cost. Powerful, beneficial, but very costly. The first versions of ACI, that was the best way to do it. So in every wire, we put a wiretap in here, NetScout, whatever product you prefer, and then redirect that over to some packet analyzer where we can see the contents of it. Liability, very expensive. Okay, in newer versions of ACI and our topic here, we can do all that in software. So any computer connected to any other computer, any way in ACI, in any flow, we can see it by just configuring in software. No need to buy any new hardware. The intelligence in the software is upgraded. Current versions, we're now at at ACI, version 5.1 is hot off the press. 5.0 was within about the last year. So if we go back in time in the fours and threes, they had the ability to do span in the software as well. But back in the early ones, 1.0, 1.2, had to have the physical wiretap to connect into. All right, next is, if I take in a traditional network and I just plug in a computer, take another computer, just plug it in, traditional switch routing. What does it take to get connectivity between them? The traditional answer is you do nothing. You plug it in, you got a network. That used to be called a blacklist model. In data networking, a blacklist model means you plug it in and it works. No action needed for connectivity. Liability though, in a network, if everything can connect to anything, security is terrible. It's easy but it's unsecure. How does a hacker hack into something? How does a criminal steal financial information? Always because they can connect. 
So in a network, if everything can connect to everything, it's terribly unsecure. Easy, but unsecure. Cisco ACI is always, by definition, the opposite. It is in a whitelist model. Whitelist means, got a computer, plug it in, and it can talk to nothing by default. Pings won't even work. Do a DNS query, it's gonna fail. Update your NTP time, it will not work in a whitelist model unless you and I do something to enable that to occur. In ACI, that is done on the top by creating a tenant. Underneath that would be an application profile. Underneath that are the logical elements shown here that create a whitelist. They're called an EPG or endpoint group. Everything in this drawing is pure software, software defined networking. So what would be the best design? Let the good guys in, keep the bad guys out. Let the traffic that needs to work for production connect. Everything else, isolate. That's the most secure network. Let only the network do what it needs to do. This is often called network segmentation. And when done to a very high degree, called micro segmentation. I mean, any computer, if it's going to talk to any other computer, it will only do so if we allow it in the whitelist. And the first way of doing that is with an EPG, endpoint group. In this example, let's say we have a web server, Linux, Microsoft based, doesn't matter. And we want to let one web server talk to another web server. If you put them in the same EPG, they have full connectivity to each other. What if we put them in a different EPG? Then they're totally isolated from each other. Analogy, you can think of an EPG as like a VLAN. They're not the same, but they're similar. In that, if I have two devices in the same VLAN, they have full connectivity. If I have devices in a different VLAN, they have no connectivity by default until we do something else. Well, in traditional VLANs, excuse me, in traditional VLANs, we would set up inner VLAN routing. In an ACI whitelist, we set up what's called a contract. A contract, it's like a cable, but it's logical. It's done in software. Where do you see the contract right here? You don't, you can't. Where is an endpoint group? It connects to an endpoint on a connection like right there. That connection, the cable that comes off the leaf, not the spine, but not the leaf, we would put in an endpoint group. This example shows three endpoint groups like a three-tiered application. Example, like a bunch of web servers, some type of application like some custom Java software program, or maybe it's a Microsoft SharePoint, any kind of database shown over here. If any EPG wants to talk to another EPG, it can only do so with the contract. So where do these things get plugged in? They could get plugged in anywhere. For example, I could have over here on a server there could be my web server. And over here on Cisco UCS, on a B server, I show, well, this could be our application server. And maybe the database is located over here. And we wanna make sure that when traffic comes in from the internet, it first goes to the web server, then goes to the application server, then goes to the database. And assuming we study our applications well, with security in mind, only let the good guys in, keep the bad guys out, how do we ensure that this will be the traffic flow? Answer, doing the whitelist, which I literally call a drawing. I mean, it looks like a drawing in ACI. You make a drawing, and the drawing decides exactly what can connect, exactly what can isolate. Where does the drawing apply? Well, always everywhere in ACI. When I make it in the APIC, it gets assigned everywhere inside here. Okay, that leads to the question. What if I have Wireshark over here, but a server over here is talking to another server over here? How do I ensure that I see the traffic in Wireshark for purpose of diagnosis, troubleshooting, to decide what went wrong? And here's a common example. I'm sure you've seen this in production. 
application client A trying to connect to application server B. It used to work. It's not working too well anymore now. What's the problem? It could be the server. It could be the client. It could be the network. Those are all possibilities. Good troubleshooting, verify what it is and what it isn't. Doing a protocol analysis is a great way of seeing visually exactly what we're doing, what we're not doing. So if there is anything wrong, we can see visually inside of that. Well, now in ACI, that is all done on the whitelist model. Same thing is shown here. Pack of decodes, Wireshark, Span, they all come from the whitelist model. So just to be sure we have all these terms, right? If you go from one EPG in the same EPG, it's kind of like a blacklist model, you're wide open. From one EPG to another EPG, totally isolated by default, unless we configure a contract. A contract is like a virtual cable. A contract, however, can be connected to either a filter, which is like an extended access list, or a separate physical device, like a firewall, a load balancer, or a group of them. This is often called a layer four through seven. They're all connected in the contract, which is like a cable, and you gotta plug it in both ends, one side of the app server, one side of the DB server in this case. Next point, a contract, oddly enough, can be empty. ACI lets us do that, but that's foolish as an empty contract does nothing. So a contract either to work, to have any meaning, to allow traffic, has to be connected to a filter or a layer four through seven. Filter means it's built in ACI. Layer four through seven means you buy another product, you plug it in the leaf, and then you make sure that it gets used. So let's say to take it further, we have traffic coming from the outside of the internet, and I wanna make sure that it first goes through our F5 load balancer, then through our virtual firewall, then it can get to the web server. Only then are we gonna let it connect to the application server. And after that, it then connects to the database. And you can see there could be a lot of different flow examples. And of course, there are in a different data center, any data center, easily controlled by a drawing. The drawing is the master source of truth of traffic flow, connectivity, and isolation. It looks like a drawing. Inside ACI, they don't use the word drawing inside the GUI, but it really is a drawing. Next, how do we get to the outside world? So ACI, sorry about that timer, ACI needs to connect in the outside. And to do so, of course, we would have some type of external router. In ACI language, connecting to the outside is called an L3 out. L3 out is the ACI term, meaning plug a router in to the leaf with one or ideally two connections that gives us access to anything outside of ACI. ACI itself only lives in the data center. So any traffic we're gonna monitor, it's gotta be in the data center or come in the data center or leave the data center. But example, traffic from here to here, somewhere in the internet, ACI will have no visibility to that. But where we have the router is kind of like the demarcation of ACI. So traffic from here to here, anything there, will have full visibility into it. But as soon as we get beyond that L3 out, like from here and beyond, in our wide area network, the campus network, branch offices, the whole internet, a data center and interconnect, simple answer is ACI won't see that unless the traffic comes in or out for monitoring as we'll see. Okay, but all traffic flow, again, is from the drawing and the drawing will literally have an icon, an object called L3 out. The other object not shown here is an L2 out. We'd use that if we wanted to connect off to a switch. So example, in this case right here, let's say there was a hacker out in the internet, wanted to see what they could poke at and learn about our data network. Doesn't matter the cabling, doesn't matter where we plug things in, but if this is the whitelist here, question, if the hacker is doing a port scan on the internet and wants to learn about our network and 
find our security exploits. What is the only thing they can see? Think of the whole internet. It can only connect in through the L throughout. So in this example, if I only have a contract here, I have to first meet the requirements of whatever firewall I want to choose here. And then the answer is only get to the web server because there's no contract. So anyone on the internet, what can they see on the application server? Nothing. What can they see about our database? Nothing. And isn't that a good thing? So if we have a database of financial information or customer information, how much of that should ever be exposed on the internet? Nothing, of course, easily achieved with just don't put a contract there. Because in a whitelist, everything you forget, it remembers and blocks. Everything we forget, it remembers and blocks. That's the, that's the, the memory aid for that. Analogy, in an access control list, an ACL, traditional router in Cisco, no trick question here, but what is the last line of an access control list? You never see it, it's always there. The answer, of course, implicit deny. Write everything you forget in the access list, it remembers and blocks. Analogy and memory aid. In ACI, implicit deny is always everywhere. Implicit deny is always everywhere. That's my wording, you won't see in a Google search, it sure is accurate and very testable. Everything you don't put in here, it remembers and blocks. So what is the only form of connectivity allowed? Only what you see in the drawing. If you don't see it, it's blocked. Which brings another common question, what about a DNS server? So I'm in my app server now and I try to get to the DNS server, I can't get to it. Well, it better be somewhere in the drawing, either in the same EPG or in a contract with a filter that allows DNS. We'd have to add TCP port 53 here, DNS port 53, and or another EPG that we add it to. Or in ACI, we could even put in what's called a common tenant and then make easy ways in the common tenant to make it accessible to everything. There's something called a preferred group that makes this easier or a contract with EPG. But bottom line, if you don't see it somewhere, it's blocked. So in doing protocol analysis, step number one is the traffic has to be allowed. There'll never be traffic you see in Wireshark if it's not allowed. Another good point is, where would be the best point from security to apply it if computer A were to be breached here? Where would be the best place to stop the hacker who somehow got into our server A. As close to the source as possible. How close can you get? Right there. So as soon as the traffic is sent out, it's going nowhere unless it's in the drawing. Otherwise, there's no way it's gonna get through. You cannot get through past it. The drawing is applied everywhere inside here. You make it in the APIC, the APIC automatically pushes it to everything else. Side note, the protocol for this is a southbound protocol known as Opflex. Opflex is built inside ACI. You don't configure it, you don't set it up, you don't install it, it's always there. It's secure, highly encrypted, TLS, runs on TCP, and it sends all the configuration to everything else. So how do you configure anything in ACI? You do it once, and it gets done everywhere in the southbound protocol of Opflex. Okay, so ACI has a database in it, and it's called the Management Information Tree, MIT. That's the name of it. It's not Oracle, it's not Sybase, it's not Informix, but in Cisco ACI, the database is called the Management Information Tree. It's also called the Data Model because all the contents in the data can be represented in the database. And always at the top of the MIT is a root. There's one root at the top. You never see it. You never do anything with it. It's always there. It's called the UNI or universe. Underneath the root, we have the application profile. I'm sorry, the tenant application profile. 
sorry, one more time right there. Under the root is the tenant. You and I would create these. And underneath there is how we set up the whole data center. It's all logical, it's all software. All these connections here are all logical. For protocol analysis, as you'll see, it's all based out of the EPG. EPG is in an application profile. An EPG has a contract to a subject to a filter that allows the traffic to go through to another EPG. In this drawing where it shows one to N, that means in a tenant, you could have many bridge domains. In a tenant, you could have many application profiles. But an EPG can only be in one application profile at the same time. An application profile can have many EPGs. N means many, one means only one here. These rules are built in. You can't change these. We have to learn them and follow them. In ACI, we cannot change them. So again, where are all these things? If I look right here, the answer is always everywhere. They're always on all devices. They're always available for that. So I didn't have to configure the EPG here and here and here because it's always everywhere. That's a benefit of software-defined networking. And you have to allow for the benefit of this mass production of configuration. Sorry about that button. You, you literally can't configure things one at a time. It has to be done in the APIC, which then will configure everything. All right, next is, so how do we set this up? In ACI, what we're gonna do is set up a span port, switch port analyzer. It's all done in software. So as a simple analogy, if I came over here and I have one switch, just in general, and I put computer A here, computer B, and I wanna see the traffic from A to B in W. Any switch won't show that by default. Even if the traffic goes to A to B, to see it, we would have to set up span. Switch port analyzer, otherwise known as port mirroring or port monitoring, we're saying the same thing. And ACI is strictly called span. Next question is, in networking, just to give the analogy here in ACI, what if I had two switches? And now computer A is sending traffic to B. A is Windows, Linux, whatever, but Wireshark is now on a different computer. The traffic from A to B works, but I wanna see it on W. How do I get it over there? The answer to that is Cisco R-SPAN, Remote Switch Port Analyzer. R-SPAN allows from one switch to the next. Then over the years, Cisco took it to the next level. Now, what if we have our same a is connecting to B, it's working, the traffic is going through, but now A connects, the switch connects to a router that connects to some big network, the internet, a WAN link, whatever, another router, and we're now way over here with Wireshark. How do we see the traffic from A to B in Wireshark? I'm not even on the same switch, I'm not on the same network. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not, but I'm far away is the key point. So to do this, Cisco came up with ERSPAN. ERSPAN is Encapsulated Remote Switch Port Analyzer. ERSPAN always runs on a GRE tunnel. Well, in ACI, that's exactly what we're doing here. It's always doing ERSPAN based on the EPGs. So notice I choose my tenant, the application profile, and then the EPG. And this traffic, I can send that to the destination, which could be way over here. So that destination could be in the data center, it could be out of the data center, it could be around the world, as long as there's IP connectivity to it. And the traffic from A to B will be put in a tunnel of generic routing encapsulation. Encapsulated remote switch port analyzer, that's what we do here in ACI, it always will tunnel. So you'll see when the traffic goes from A to B, it will then be put in a tunnel from here to here. Trivia question. How many IP addresses will be found right here in a single packet? Well, one from A, one to B, but there'll be two more. 
The answer will be four IP addresses, one from the source and destination and one from the tunnel on one end, one from the tunnel on the other end. You'll see four IP addresses in here as a result of doing the span port on this. Because span based on a tenant, what we're seeing here is always done based on a capsulated remote switch port analyzer. Benefit, that IP address could be anywhere. This example shows a private address, RFC 1918. Of course, we could have a public address and route through any network. As long as there's IP connectivity, we're good to go. So notice the EPG that shows up in here, and this screenshot is from inside ACI, that EPG is anyone you want to look at. So I want to look at anyone talking to the app server. Or I want to look at anyone talking to the DB server. You can make these anywhere you like. Is there a catch? Well, there's always a catch. The version of the hardware you buy determines the number of span sessions you can set up in ACI. Older versions of hardware didn't support as many. If you're looking at a version that came out around 2015, you get about four total span ports at any one time throughout the ACI fabric. Later versions of hardware, the, a the ASICs are more powerful, meaning the chip that's put inside. Cisco made more powerful, so they allow more span ports. Old, bad, new, good. And that's the reality of the number of span ports you can have simultaneously. But you could always make a span port and shut it off. Then come back, turn it on again. It's easy to configure, and you notice there's not too many settings you need to have inside here to make this work. The main ones is the tenant, the application profile, and the EPG. And again, if we look over here, You'll see that as the tenant, the application profile, and the EPG. So any traffic going to and from this, I can now see anywhere else I want, anywhere out in the world. Another way of looking at this, when troubleshooting anything, what's better? You can see more of what's going on or you see less of what's going on. That's meant to be a very hopeful common sense question. More eyes in the game, better. The more you can see, better. The more you know of what's going on, better. More looking always is better troubleshooting. And that's exactly what we can see here. This span port will show anything, any traffic that's going to and from that connection outside there. If you were to take Wireshark and actually look at a packet decode, here you could see what that decode would look like. And notice GRE always is used with ER span, certainly so in ACI. It, it's always there. So again, notice there's the inner and the outer IP header. Here, Ethernet shows up twice. IP shows up twice. Notice in this header, there literally are four IP addresses. And those four IP addresses would be Computer A wants to talk to B, and I'm over here with Wireshark. So the traffic from A to B would work if it's in the whitelist. There's two IP addresses. And then ACI encapsulates this traffic in ER span to the other IP address where you're destined to, wherever that may be. So when troubleshooting, there's two parts in this. What is ACI doing to the frame, and then what is the end user doing? In this simple example, the user was just doing a simple ping test. Okay, but we can see that or anything inside here. GRE does not add security. It is not doing any cryptography. So ER span is not encrypting anything. It's simply, it's kind of like a giant copy machine. It's copying, that's my generic wording, but copying all the packets as they are, and sending them anywhere else so we can see them, see the detailed versions of them. So word another way, where we do ER span, there are some other impacts it does in the network. So if I come back over here, if I have Wireshark set up some side on our network and I'm monitoring all traffic from an EPG, 
that I have hundreds of computers in, that's a lot of traffic that has to go all the way through here just for your span. Caution, be sure to analyze the network capacity where you do ER span through. It definitely impacts the bandwidth. How much? Well, it depends on how much traffic's going through. The network's not doing much, there's not much traffic, but if it's doing a lot, there's a lot that can come through for sure. So another example, could I have Wireshark closer in? Sure, you can put it anywhere with an IP address that is connectivity. One example where you would not put Wireshark though is off of the spine. That's just not done, not done. Uh, we don't plug in anything else off the spine that's in the data center. So server, router, all that goes off the leaf. There's a single exception if we have multi-site and multi-site is the only case where I do plug in something else to the spine, like another router to connect to another data center. But all the servers, Windows, Linux, load balancer, firewall, everything, it's all under the leaf for sure. Okay, and again, the end result is, as shown, you can see all the details of everything coming through on this. Again, what hardware do you need to buy? None. Just set up the spine and leaf. And of course, you must have a whitelist. If there's no whitelist, your Wireshark decodes will look pretty boring because nothing's going to come through because there literally is no traffic at all. And again, to clarify that, I bought a new data center. I plug everything in. I have not configured a whitelist. What type of traffic will be allowed by default? Nothing until a whitelist is configured. And the whitelist is where all the analysis and monitoring is done from. Again, the tenant, application profile in the EPG. Number of span sessions supported depends on the hardware version. Later hardware versions with more powerful hardware support more at the same time. And again, uh, Wireshark could be located anywhere. And you'll always see those four addresses in the GRE, Generic Routing Encapsulation. All right, team, any questions? And Chris, I don't uh, see any questions that have been posted but I do have a couple of questions myself as part of the presentation. I guess the one thing is, what, what are some of the speeds that uh, you see within the data center on the spine and leaf? Yep. So Cisco started off in ACI version. Uh, you may want to hit mute there, buddy. Let's say we got a little echo coming through. <clears throat> Thanks. So speeds. Um, the first version of ACI back on 1.0 the slowest speeds ever supported were 40 gigabit per second. You literally couldn't even buy anything slower. 40 gigabit per second was the beginning, April 2013 debut ACI 1.0. As versions continued later, we jumped up to 100 gigabit per second. In recent years, there now are 400 gigabit per second cables, and that's just one cable one time. In addition, you can always double up the cabling to double the bandwidth by just plugging the cable. And equal cost multipathing is always there and always allowed to support it. I see a couple of good questions coming through there. Uh, can I send EPG traffic via net flow? Um, the answer is yes, but again, when we send it away, if we're using the tenant, we're sending it away to whatever destination you choose here. So if that destination is a NetFlow receiver and is any type of software to receive it on NetFlow, then your answer is yes. So we need something on the other end to receive that. That was Robert's question, that's a yes. Uh, I see another question, Ali. Yeah. Is the understanding correct that SDN means configuring the fabric or devices from a controller? Great question. So SDN in general is a top level name or it's a industry standard term. It's very commonly used. Software defined networking actually got started with the idea of a controller. And ACI uses the same concept of a controller here. Controller means network configuration done in a server. Then the server 
then configures all the network devices. Software-defined networking is the ability to configure multiple devices at the same time. A second part of the answer to the question is the separation from the control plane and the data plane. When the first envisions of software-defined networking started, the idea was, why don't we take all the brains of a router and all the brains and intelligence of the switch, take them out of the switch, put them all in the server. That is one possible example, but ACI does something in between. So the idea is, <clears throat> well, what would happen if the APIC were to go down? So let's go through a traffic flow on that. And this is a, an example of separation of the control plane and the data plane. Traffic comes in, I go to a firewall, I then come to my load balancer, whatever it might be, and then go to the servers, and all this is working. But then the APIC goes down. What happens to the production traffic when the brain totally dies? Answer, nothing, it keeps working great because the control plane and the data plane are separated. This is something Cisco does a bit uniquely in software-defined networking, because there is some intelligence in the spine and leaf. They can operate on their own. They just have to be told what to do by the APIC, but they can live on their own. So the APIC pushes the policy, but then if the APIC is not available, the network still works. Silly analogy, take a chicken chop its head off. I'm not recommending it, but if you do, the chicken body will actually run around the yard. I'm not recommending to do it, but it's a true statement. Analogy, ACI is doing the same thing because the brain is gone, the body still lives. And that is what makes Cisco a little different than other SDN implementations because the spine and leaf, they'll remember what to do and they'll keep doing it exactly as the APIC said it. Now that said, if all the APICs are down, you cannot manage anything. I cannot change a configuration. So if that's a concern that all the APICs are going down, buy another one. Sorry, that's why we typically have three of them here. Typically have three of them, or you could even have five of them as well. A side note, the number of APICs is typically an odd number. It, the APIC is replicating the content in what's called sharding. Sharding is the mathematical term in databases that replicate the content from one to the next. So every APIC knows exactly what every APIC does. Which APIC to use to configure? Doesn't matter. What if one's broken? All right, use the other one. What if it's broken? All right, use the other one. What if it's broken? Then I can't change a configuration because the only configuration changes ever possible on the APIC. But the network stays up the whole time separation of control plane and data plane. Next, I see a question. Um, are there any limits on contracts used by EPGs? So the answer is yes, and that is a, a version dependent issue. So every version of ACI, there's a, a maximum um, configuration limit document that shows the maximum number you can have. But typically, the answer is way more than you'll ever need, but there always is a limit. Uh, we're not talking millions of contracts, but on the order of hundreds. Once again, depending on the version of ACI. Later versions of ACI typically increase the numbers of quantity of objects supported because the hardware keeps getting stronger, faster, better as Cisco designs it more and more. Are there other ways to span monitor with an ACI? Again, the first way that I mentioned, you could have physical wiretaps put inside here. Very powerful, great visibility, very expensive. But a physical wiretap would show all traffic that came through here, no matter what it's doing. So how would I get from A to B? You definitely see it with a wiretap. Okay, but again, very expensive. So doing it based out of the whitelist, no cost. There's no added hardware cost for this. Yeah, Chris, a quick question on that. Um, have you seen or you recommend any what I'll call third party um, monitoring tools like SolarWinds, you know, NetBrain, that type of thing? Have you seen that in a working environment? 
Yeah, great question. And uh, to be honest with you, my favorite and one of the most common ones is totally free. Sorry again there. And that would be Mr. Wireshark. So Wireshark, I find is one of the best answers to Brad's question there. It's free, form or name ethereal, or do you say ethereal? It is totally free. Just do Wireshark in Google, download it. And that's, it's a great tool. It has full capacity to see everything we're monitoring here with SPAN. Another good question, Garrison, how do I troubleshoot this? If we can prove that web server A <clears throat> is reaching app server B, but we don't know how it's getting there. How do we figure out which contract is letting the traffic through? Okay, the answer is you always make this drawing and you have to put things in this drawing. And that's a key point to Garrison's question. Example, if I have a server here, you have to custom put it in the EPG. Now this drawing isn't showing that, but you will always do it. You can always configure it. You'll always see it. So here I show a putting a database server called DB1, whatever, and putting it in this endpoint group called DB for database. The name could be called anything. But the key point is you make the drawing and you link the drawing to what you plug in always. So if here's a server here, computer A, you must assign it to either a physical port like I show here, or a port channel, or a virtual port channel, like I show here. And when you do that, you're putting the computer in the EPG. And that's how you know that computer is in the EPG. And that's the EPG you select when you do span. So on Garrison's question, you control it because you configure it and you have to configure it. Remember, if I plug something in here and I don't plug it in this, and I don't configure it, it has no connection to the network. It's not gonna work at all. Chris, the next question is on uh, NetFlow. Yep, so um, um, ACI does have a couple other NetFlow features that have been added in. And uh, again, that's in rec more recent versions. So again, if in your ACI environment, you wanna be upgraded to four or ideally five or 5.1 in current times. Um, you wouldn't wanna stay in a version three or prior. But if you do that, then there is a NetFlow feature that is built in. And it's built into the software so you can figure it again on the APIC. So I could take that NetFlow traffic that's looking at all the different flows and then send it off to a span port or a NetFlow server. The NetFlow server, that's something you decide. ACI doesn't come with that. But redirecting it where you want it to, that we can configure inside here. Ali, a good question. Uh, is it not separation of management plane for the data plane rather than control plane? It's a great question. So technically they are all different. So right over here, here I sit at Windows, typically in an out of band network, not shown in the drawing here, but a separate ethernet network where I'm gonna connect in Windows, Linux, whatever it may be. Here's the northbound connection. ACI configures everything else in the southbound connection. The north and south are management. You and I do our work in the north, ACI does it in the south. It's for configuration, that's the Optlex protocol. Then the data plane is actually done with a tunneling protocol, since you're asking here, called VXLAN. VXLAN is the data plane. So VXLAN tunnels always on the leafs. I come in a tunnel, come out of a tunnel. Any east-west traffic, I come in a leaf, Come out of leaf that is always tunneled. That data plane is separate from the management plane, is separate from the control plane. The control plane, to be able to determine how does the spine and leaf find each other, there's two protocols, ISIS and COOP. Intermediate system, intermediate system is a routing protocol built into ACI where all the spines find all the leaves automatically. You don't have to do anything for it. The Council of Oracle Protocol, goofy name, Cisco created that. If you're a Matrix fan, you like the Oracle or studied ancient Greeks in the, 
the Delphi Oracle. Well, that's kind of where they get the name from. And the idea is it's a big giant show Mac address table with more info. Every spine will learn about every device down below here with COOP. So control plane, ISIS and COOP. Data plane, VXLAN. Management plane, Opflex. They're all separate, they all work together. And Chris, you're gonna like Garrison's question that he has. He, he inherited his environment. He just wants to figure out, you know, how does he put this drawing together? I love it. Okay, so the answer is, Connect in the APIC, use proper credentials to connect in. Step two, click on the tenant. Here, I'll write the map on this. Step two is you click on the tenant. Now you may find there's many other tenants. So very important to Garrison's question, every tenant can have its own whitelist. All tenants are isolated from every other tenants by default. So when you connect in, go and look at all the tenants. You will see three tenants by default. Their name is common, infra, and management. You probably won't find the answer in those, although you may want to look in the common tenant to see what someone else did. So step one, go to all the tenants, then click on application profile. It'll be spelled out full application profile. Then look to your right and click on a tab that says topology and there all shall be revealed. You'll literally see the drawing that looks like this. I mean, the icons are different, but it will be a drawing that will show the detailed whitelist. It's always visible. Requirement, you must have access to the APIC. Side note, ACI can have RBAC configured where you may only have access to one tenant. So if you have the admin user account, then you can get the full answer question. Admin account, sorry about my sloppy writing there will have full access to all tenants. But other users may have been configured for RBAC, role-based access control. Example, in ACI, I could configure user Joe to only see one tenant, but not another tenant. And Fred to see that other tenant, but not your tenant. That's RBAC. ACI allows that for security purposes. So be sure, Garrison, to finish your question, that you do have full administrative authority, the admin user account, and then you can see all tenant. So once again, click on tenant, application profile, look in the middle of the screen, there's a tab that says topology, and you'll see a big drawing, read the drawing, and there will be the answer. Whatever you don't see in the drawing, implicit deny is always everywhere, it's blocked. Okay, thanks, Chris. That's uh, all the Q&As that are out. Oh, I just got one coming in very quick. Oh, you're welcome, Garrison. Um, so Chris, we can go through the wrap up screens here. And next, yeah, um, Jamie, if you wanna go over our offerings from Global Knowledge courses that we have for ACI, thank you. Thanks, Brad. And if, as Brad just mentioned, uh, if anybody's looking to continue their ACI uh, information training here, uh, these are the offerings that Global Knowledge does have uh, so people like Chris and any other CCSI accredited instructor will be uh, taking care of these courses. Um, the first two there, DCACI and DCACIO, along with actually the one below that, DCACIA, will be three courses to help with the CCMP data center certification, along with a specialization certification. The DCAUI, <clears throat> will actually uh, follow along those lines as well with CCMP data center, as well as the DevNet track as well. And lastly, you see the application Cit Citric infrastructure administration operations and troubleshooting. And that's actually a global knowledge um, exclusive course. And that will actually combine a lot of the content that you see from the first two courses there to DCACI and DCACIO. Um, if anyone that is not necessarily interested in certification, but does want to get the, the ACI training, I, I would recommend that course there. Thanks, Brad. Okay, thank you, Jamie. And Chris, next slide, please. Yeah, and just want to thank everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. And if you want to learn more, um, do go to our website and uh, you know, look at the, uh, the course outlines that uh, Jamie went over. 
Um, as far as uh, what we want to do today is we want to make it easier for you to take the next step. Uh, so what we're doing is we're offering some discount codes. You can receive 25% off your next global knowledge uh, training course uh, in the U.S. Use the Webinar 25. If you're from Canada, use uh, CA Webinar 25. And next slide, Chris. And of course, you can follow us on social media. Um, make sure you uh, continue to visit our Global Knowledge website to access additional free resources. We have things like technical articles, white papers, and webinars. And Chris, that is it. Let's go to our last slide. We can close it off. Again, globalknowledge.com. Uh, Chris, any last words of wisdom, any info from the field that you'd like to close this off on, then we'll call it a wrap. Sure, thank you, Brad. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, one final question from Scott. Is cloud ACI using the same span process? Uh, the answer is yes. And just to elaborate on Scott's final good question, uh, Cisco, a few years ago, just started offering the same ACI whitelist to be exported in a hybrid cloud model into Amazon Web Service, the Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure. So it's a tight relationship with those cloud providers to take the ACI concept and put it in there. So that's the qualifier to Scott's question. You have to have that cloud service that supports ACI. So do other cloud services exist? Sure, but not all to support ACI. So requirement one, have to have it there. Uh, but if so, then your answer is yes, Scott. You would configure it just the same way as shown in ACI. It's all done from the software. Great, thank you all. With that, we'll wrap it up for the day. Um, we will be recording this. We'll send it out to your, the email that you registered in. And I'd like to thank everybody uh, for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Excellent presentation. Bye for now. Thanks all. Have a good afternoon.